When Jesus comes, the tempest power is broken. When Jesus comes, all fear is wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills our life with glory. All has changed when Jesus comes to stay. When Jesus comes, the tempest power is broken. When Jesus comes, all fear is wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills our life with glory. All has changed. When Jesus comes to stay. Saints, everybody on here, as you're joining in, share this broadcast and say, Lord, I receive the prophet's reward. As you're joining in, share this broadcast and say, Lord, I receive the prophet's reward. We give God all praise. Now, we're doing a deep teaching on here. We're doing a deep teaching. Now, saints, every temptation in your life is simply what you have allowed yourself to be opened up to. So you can know your future satanic devices that's going to come up against you. You can know them. You can predict them because it's simply what you already has been already been exposed to. Everything that's going to become an opportunity for you to quit on God or get out of flow with God is going to be something that you opened up yourself to in the past. So if you're a lustful person, that means that Satan is going to give your eyes an opportunity to look at somebody. And while you're looking at them, while you start pursuing them, you're going to get out of the will of God while you're pursuing them. If you're someone that your weakness is food, God is going to call you into a fast. And all Satan going to do is remind you of all the good food that you have tasted. <laughs> That's all Satan going to do is remind you of what you have ate. Remind you of your greatest piece of chicken. Remind you of your greatest burger. Remind you of your greatest rice. Your greatest corn. Your greatest bread. Cornbread. Um, going to remind you of your greatest cake. Um... I'm talking about food. Um, <laughs> and what you were introduced to is going to be the thing that tempts you. So saints, what I, what I want to say here in wisdom is that be very careful how you're managing your idle time. Because it's what you're opening up yourself to. That's what's going to tempt you in the future when you're in your right mind and you're ready to serve God. See, saints, there was something powerful and the Spirit of the Lord told me before I got on here. The Spirit of the Lord told me that the reason why the Pharisees couldn't receive me is because I was showing them something that's opposite to what was already introduced to them as godliness. So what's going on in the text is that they're introduced to godliness as being synagogue, uh, a certain appearance, certain vocabulary, certain behavior. And King Jesus is coming with a whole complete different behavior system, a whole complete different vocabulary, a whole complete different schedule, requirement, commandment, revelation. Remember what they begin to say, who is this man with this authority and this doctrine? Where is he getting this wisdom from? So it is something that wasn't introduced to them before. Now, here's the, 
Here's the, sh the, the bad thing about this, the negative thing about this, the downside of this, is that their temptation was simply tradition, religion. So now King Jesus is coming to them and they have already decided what godliness looks like, what righteousness looks like, what obedience looks like. So this is why traditional and religious people are so hard to win to God. They are hard because they have already done godliness before God even showed up. So now when God shows up, they already have what God does and what God says and how God operates and what God likes and what God doesn't like. They have already decided before meeting God. Now imagine you deciding what I like before meeting me and never knowing my mind. And you say, Prophet Joshua Holmes, you know, he likes sandals and I don't like sandals. <laughs> Prophet Joshua Holmes, you know, he like, you know, he like to eat big buffets four times in a day. And I don't like eating no big buffets four times in a day. Are you seeing this? And that was the dangerous thing with religious people. Is that they had already decided what God like, what God looked like, what God will require, what God is in agreement with. So when God comes down in the flesh and is revealing to them, this is who I am. This is what I like. This, they're saying no. But saints, let's look at this in the depth. They were introduced to this. So people of God, what I want you to see is that they were introduced to religion. What I'm showing you that everybody has their different demon that they're introduced to before they get into the will of God. And that is the only thing that's going to combat you when you get in the will of God. So right now, you may be a person that's not fully surrendered. Most likely you are. Because to be fully surrendered, you have to do a lot of things that's going to go against the status quo. When you are fully surrendered, God won't let you hang around certain people. He won't let you call certain people on the phone. He'll change your number. He'll sanctify you. He'll set you apart. And, and most people are not willing to go through that until they go through enough betrayal and hurt and pain to say yes to the will of God. If we be honest, a lot of times you go through hard-headed consequences before you say yes. Like saints, some people, they have to get sick before they finally realize who people are in their life. Because the people start manifesting themselves. You see them disrespect you while you're sick. You see them talk to you roughly when you're sick. You see them call your names when you're sick. You see them question your authority when you're sick. And then you finally realize, hey, this person don't mean me well. But see, God was already telling you that before you got sick. It's just the sickness magnifies the word of the Lord. The same way when you get poor. If you have financial issues, lose all your money, you see who, who start telling you, how come you lost all your money? See, you're not a child of God. See, look what you're going through. And God had already told you about a person before that, but you need to see it in the right atmosphere. Saints, the Lord always tells you the truth. You may not be in the season where you can receive it. All your life, God has told you the truth. God has told you about people. He's told you about decisions. He's told you about places. He told you about mindsets. He told you about what was illegal. He told you about what was permitted. He told you about what he wanted all your life, but you're not in the season to receive it. So you shut him out. Now, since the scary thing is when you shut him out religiously, now, that's true wickedness. Because saints, when God spoke to Jonah and told Jonah to go to Nineveh, if Jonah would have went to Asia and went go preach there, God was not switching from the instruction. You have to understand that God is not moving on from his instruction. You know, there's some people, like, they act like God didn't, God told them to do something and then they didn't do it. And they like, God moved on with what he told me. He's not telling me to do that same thing no more. He gave me a new instruction. No, he didn't. 
He telling you the same thing. Moses ran from God for 40 years and God doubled back around and still said, hey, you ready now? Go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. See, God is not changing. Moses is changing. For 40 years, he's doing things to make himself feel good. Think about that. Ma caramba, ando rebe, ki rande de sorobo correve. Rande de saranda da raba. Imagine for 40 years, for, for four decades, he's doing stuff to make him feel righteous. Make him feel holy. Make him feel in right standing with God. He's doing rituals. He's doing spiritual things. He's doing things that make him look like a good person. And God is not pleased with Moses. And saints, this is the life that, that you still live today. You do stuff all the time that God is not pleased with, but you do it in, 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 in alliance of this is your righteousness. You're a good person. You're sanctified. You're a believer. You're saved. And that's not your instruction from God. Saints, we might look at Moses and say, how could you do for 40 years? But some of you are on here for 40 years. You have lied to yourself. And see, saints, th this is why your life don't look like the Bible. The Bible talks about someone moving in power, being the lender, not the borrower, being the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, being a new creation. Old things passed away. All things become new. Walking in the spirit and not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. Being a dominator, renewing in the spirit of your mind in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 23. If you are in Christ, you walk as he walked. First John chapter 2 verse 6. You walk in, in the spirit and, and, and all the fruits of the spirit is coming out of you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 21 and 22. You walk in, in gentleness, in love, in peace, in joy, in uh, uh, temperance and patience. You walk in, in self-control. All these things are moving through you. Galatians 5, 22. And then we move on to Galatians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. That you are Christ and you have crucified all of your passions and lusts. You belong to Christ. Then we move on to Galatians chapter 5, verse 24 and 25. Say that if you, um, if you uh, live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. You live in the spirit in the mind. You walk in the spirit according to decision making. So the living in the spirit is the mindset. The walking in the spirit is the decisions that you make out of that mindset. But see, you and the Bible don't be adding up. You know why? Because you have become comfortable in making your own instructions that's not from God. Saints, the Bible says that train up a child in the way that they should go, but yet we celebrate our untrained children. Think about that. The Bible said train up a child in the way that they should go. But then we celebrate the paths of our children that's not even from God. Oh, my child played baseball. God didn't create your child to play baseball. You celebrate them playing baseball. Oh, my child is a musician. God didn't create your child to be a musician. You celebrate your child being a musician. Your child in ballerina school. God didn't create your child to be in ballerina school. You celebrate your child being in ballerina school. Your child is going to school for technology. God didn't create your child for technology, but you're going, you celebrate your child. We often celebrate in this wickedness. We celebrate people while they're doing what God didn't create them to do. And we think that that's love. If I love you, I'm not going to cheerlead you into eternal hell. I'm not going to clap my hands when you're in rebellion to God. If I truly love you, when I see the devil moving in you, I will not be in agreement.
I've seen parents tell their children, you know, I know that you live in this type of life, but I love you so much. I just want you to know I stand by you and I agree with you and I'm here to support you. Well, they may not say that agreement stuff, but they'll say I'm here to support you. I'm not supporting nothing that's not of God if I'm of God, because now you have to betray God to support that. You can't serve two masters. Either you're all the way in with Jesus or you're all the way in with Satan. And if you're in between, you're with Satan. Because the walk that King Jesus calls you to, he wants all of you. Remember, I always tell you, if 99% of you is walking with God and 1% is not, you're not walking with God. Because that 1% is your love for Satan. The Bible says, don't give a lot of place to the devil. It says, give no place. So if Satan has a place, you still love Satan. Now, since this is another revelation that a lot of people have never even thought about, that you come into this world loving Satan. And even after the prayer of salvation, you don't get to learn how to love God. You just think that you love God because you prayed the prayer. But really, when you pray the prayer, you're petitioning God that you want to learn how to love him. But you don't be realizing that. So you act like you love him as soon as you pray the prayer. Lord, I come into my heart. I repent of my sin. Forgive me. And then you act like you love the Lord. No, you don't love the Lord. You're, you're making steps to love the Lord. You're making an application. You're telling the Lord, I'm going to do this. So that I can create time for you to change me into what you love, into doing what you love. But that's not you by default. If God was to look into your life today, how many people that you talk to brings grief to God? How, how many people in your life do you enjoy that God despises? Saints, I know these things bad because I be praying for my partners. I be praying for those of you all that listen to me. I, I, I remember just recently I was praying for somebody. And you know what the Spirit of the Lord told me? You'll never know what I'm talking about. I ain't going to call their name or nothing like that. Embarrass nobody. So I just, I just pity. It. It's just common knowledge, you know. But the Spirit of the Lord began to tell me, this one right here, they're going back and forth with their child's father. They're not sanctified and pure. They're in a defiled place. So I want you to pray that they'll step into purity and sanctification and be free from this defilement. Because oftentimes you think because you have a child with somebody that God has placed you with them forever. And that's the biggest lie from the pit of hell. Because sometimes the person you have a child with, God never even scheduled for you to have a child with them. Your lust scheduled that. But I was praying for someone and then God began to tell me, this person, you may, you, according to the natural, it may look like they're pure. It may look like they're following you. It may look like they're listening to you, but this is what they're doing. I have that happen to me a lot of times in my ministry. Like, I think that somebody is flowing with me because I see them on my line. I see them talking. I see them saying hallelujah. I see them saying the praise God. I see them saying, and it looked like they get into wisdom and get into change. And then God will double back and tell me, no, this person not free. They're not changed. It's powerful. You need a seer in your life. I remember I started walking in the seer's ability at two. Two years old. I would see spirits. I would see angels. I would see demons. By the time I was five, I had a visitation from the Lord himself. And he didn't say nothing to me. By the time I was 14, the Spirit of the Lord gave me another visitation. I would fast every Saturday and Sunday. Dry fasting, no food, no water. Sometimes I would break the fast. Because <laughs> you got to train yourself to fast. Sometimes I break the fast. 
And I remember one weekend, the Spirit of God gave me another privilege and I, the Lord showed up in my room and I hit the floor. I couldn't look up. There was a big old great light in front of me. I couldn't look up. And it like my room was disappeared. I was in the upstairs room. I remember the house number and everything. I think the time was around 3 p.m. after 3 p.m. And I remember the Lord saying verbatim everything to me about my calling and then what I would suffer and this walk as a prophet. But then the path, you don't stop there. You have to give yourself fully over to being trained by God. Like a lot of times you get to the path of repentance, but you don't get to the path of being conformed to him. You get to the path of recognizing, hey, what I did was wrong. I need to change. I want salvation. I want deliverance. But then you don't, you don't enter into the path where the deliverance is. You reject it. You resist it. Because saints, the path of deliverance is God going to have you submit to authority. There's going to be someone talking to you as if they're God. And how you treat them and how you handle them and how you respond to them is how the spirit is going to evaluate you. That's going to be your summary. That's going to be your end report. So if you disrespect them, you're disrespecting God. If you disobey them, you're disobeying God. If you hear them and don't do what they say, that's the same thing you're doing to God. You're ignoring God. And I have walked that path. I truly believe that men, when your children... God will let you have like a mother or a motherly figure that you submit to to break out that ego. Because when you're listening to a woman and you're a man, even though you're a boy, it is still there's a manliness because man, the original order is to be over a woman. So if that woman is over you, you actually have more of an advantage to, to, to um, master in the art of submission. And mastering the art of patience and humility and meekness because you're already in a place where you're listening to someone that is already formed and uh, presented as lower than you. But in this bracket, you're lower than them. Like you don't see much interaction with Jesus and Joseph. But you see a lot of interaction with Jesus and Mary. His mother. Psalm 119 verse 66 says, teach me good judgment. Judgment not be, don't be good. Your judgment don't be good. Teach me good judgment and knowledge. Because the knowledge that you be having, be destroying you. Remember, I was just talking about in the beginning of this broadcast, your idle time can make you a student of knowledge that corrupts you, destroys you, damages you, messes you up. So look what the text is saying. Teach me good judgment. See, so that means that there is evil judgment. Now, what is judgment in its clearest form? It's the ability to decide something, make a decision. It's your fervent choice. That's what does judges do? They make decisions. So when it says teach me good judgment, it's saying teach me the decisions, the fervent choices that come from the Holy Ghost. Teach me the things that the Holy Ghost want me to do in 24 hours. So if I'm going to a church and you didn't send me to a church, teach me not to go to that church because that's not your instruction. 
if you didn't send me to Bible school, teach me not to go to this Bible school because it's not your instruction. And since how Satan been beating up people that have great callings on their life is Satan knows not to send something utterly sinful to you oftentimes. Satan will get you to do religious witchcraft, have you do churchy witchcraft, have you do um, self-righteous witchcraft. Because Satan knows the bracket in which you have chosen to plant yourself in things that pertain to the word of God, things that pertain to, 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 to prayer, things that pertain to spirituality. So that's where Satan disguises himself. Martha was introduced to things before she met Jesus. So when she meets Jesus, she don't want to let them go. Which is the problem of every woman that has great favor scheduled for her. She don't want to let them go. She meets King Jesus and she's holding on to the knowledge that she had, the judgments that she had before. Now, her judgment was to go and serve and do all this stuff. And King Jesus is not interested in that. King Jesus is telling her, sit your ugly self down. You and everybody's face, you always got to be seen. You want somebody to celebrate you. Sit down. You already did that. Sit down. And saints, it's a form of retardation when God comes to you and you still trying to retrieve things that you used to do that didn't bring you the changes that the word of God promised would happen. See, it takes a lot of humbling of self for you to make it into the God path. Martha, her pride, she don't want to let these things go. She hear the Lord teaching on it. She hear the Lord telling her, but she don't want to let it go because these are her gods. These are her idols. Let go of your idols. He wants it all today. Bow down. She don't want to let go. God trying to pull it from her. She don't want to let it go. And that often happened with people with great destinies. They won't let go of the knowledge that they had before. They won't let go of the judgments that they had before. Let it go. This is not anointing you. This is not getting you into heaven. See, saints, you got to get past that religiosity. Heaven is not going to receive you because you did all these good works according to your flesh and according to your own righteousness. Only those that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. And Satan don't mind you doing stuff religiously as long as it's outside of your instruction because Satan knows that it's going to land you to eternal damnation with Satan. Impurity bursts stubbornness. Impurity. Purity discovers freedom. Purity discovers adaptation. Purity, it receives newness of life. Purity is a prophetic eye to only see God. When Jonah did not go to Nineveh, do you think that God was going to give him a new instruction? Okay, Jonah, let's go preach over here in uh, Jerusalem. No, that was it. Jonah went and didn't do it, and God stayed right there in the instruction he gave. See, God is not moving on from his instructions. 
Now, saints, I want to say something to you. Okay, say God tell you to minister to somebody, a stranger, and like they disappear. You didn't minister to them. They go on, you never see them again. You don't know how to retrieve them. That's different. You know you can't locate that person. They're somewhere, you know, and that's, that's it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about instructions for life. I'm talking about God saying, go to a place. Now, you know that he said, go to the place. The place still exists. So you could go to that place. He's not changing until you go to the place. And since one of the great greatest destroyers of your own life is that you never complete the instruction that God gives but you think that he's making new ones. I once knew of a person that God told them to sow into a man. And they wouldn't sow into the man. And one day they met another man and said, God told me to sow into this man. What they don't understand is God is not telling them to sow into another man because God's original instruction is sow into this man. So this instruction is never obeyed. He not given a new instruction and the man still exists. But see, wickedness will find a way To do something else other than what was commanded because what's commanded going to kill you. That's a reason why people don't listen to God's instruction because the instruction is to kill you and you saying, no, I don't want to die. So you go pick your own instruction. In my lifetime, I've told people specifically, go on a fast here. You need to go on a fast for this amount of days. They didn't go on the fast, then all type of chaos hit their life. They start crying. Well, what do you expect? The instruction is not changing. There's nothing we need to pray for. There's no assistance in that. The assistance is go on the fast. So they don't go on the fast, start losing everything. Everything start going left. We don't need to pray about this. The instruction is the way out. See, saints in life, we love to make spirituality the solution even when God has given us the instruction. The instruction is the true spirituality, not what you have decided to do, but what he said that you should decide to do. What did David say in Psalm 119 verse 66? Teach me good judgment. And knowledge. Teach me good judgment and knowledge. What is David saying? Teach me what is the decision you love. Teach me which choices please you. Which decisions make you happy? Teach me what they are. Let's go to verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Look at what David is saying here. 
Before you afflicted me, I went astray. See, you stray from God because you ain't been beat enough. God be having to whoop you because you're hard head. The same way you can have children. You don't want to beat your children. You got to beat their big head self because they won't listen. You got to whoop them to quicken them. You can't do this. And that's what God be doing. You lock his hands. He got to whoop you. Because he's not willing to relinquish the calling that he got on you. He want to use you. He want to bless you. He want to give you newness of life. He want to take you into what he has promised you. And he loves you so much. So he got to whoop you because you let the devil in. You love Satan. God loves you and you love Satan. No prophet, I don't love Satan. You know, I just sometimes I go through a hard time. What's the hard time? What's the hard time? The hard time is you wanting to do what Satan wants you to do and knowing that God doesn't want you to do it. Is that the hard time? You know how that sounds? You love the devil. Oh, I'm struggling right now. You know, what are you struggling with? What? You only can struggle if there's two opposite departments going against each other. So you're all the way for God. Yeah, I'm all the way from God, but I'm struggling right now. No, 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 no. You're supposed to be all the way for God. There's a percentage of you that's all the way for Satan. In your knowledge, you know that you're supposed to be all the way for God. You open up yourself to the demonic realm. The demonic realm doesn't have power to open you up. Wow. 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 The demonic realm does not have power to open you up. So saints, here's what's so amazing. No demon since the beginning of time has been able to open up anybody to sin. You open up yourself to the demons because you don't value what God gives you. You don't respect it. See, saints, it, there's something if you walk into somebody's house and they say, take your shoes off. If you respect their house, you'll do it. If you disrespect the house, you'll open up yourself of how you could go against the instruction. My God. So saints in life, even struggle is you actually liking what you did open up yourself to. So what is, the, what is the goal? You guard your heart and respect what God gives you. You can't guard what you don't cherish. Why would somebody allow their child to go inside of a zoo of lions because they don't cherish the child? If you cherish the child, you'll watch the child closely Make sure that they don't enter into no zoo camp. I mean, no lion camp at the zoo. See, whatever you don't cherish, you don't protect. So what can we say about the disciples? Why is only one of them, John, at the cross that we can notify? That we could document? Because John is the only one that respects the words of Jesus. Now, Jesus told 11 other men this same thing. 
but John is the only one that respects it. John is the only one that takes it serious. And John is the only one that goes and supports his master at the cross. All of your losses in life is connected to what you disrespect. Whether it be the loss of strength, the loss of joy, the loss of energy, the loss of excitement, the loss of focus, the loss of peace, the loss of consistency, the loss of faithfulness, the loss of prayer, the loss of sowing seed, the loss of honor, the loss of submission, the loss of discipline, the loss of self-control, the loss of gratitude is all connected to disrespect. Disrespect is the master of all losses. And the Holy Spirit, when he teaches you things, if you don't respect it, you'll go opposite to what's being taught. But the Holy Spirit, when he loves you, he will always speak to you about what not to do so that you won't do it. Because he loves you. That's what he always does. The Holy Spirit always speaks to you about what not to do because he loves you. He always does that. Before you ever have anything pulling you away from God, he'll always come to you and talk to you about what not to do. What not to allow enter in. Saints, I, I, I look at my teaching. I've been teaching uh, for years now done did thousands of broadcasts, thousands of teachings, done spent over hundred thousands of, of hours teaching. And I've noticed something, if not millions, of minutes, seconds, hours just going teaching, and I realize that I often have to keep on teaching on the same thing. And it's not because people love God, but it's because people love Satan. So you have to keep on throwing out the bait of how to love God because of the strength of loving Satan that's in individuals. And I noticed that I have always prepared people for their own demons manifesting. I always do it. I've always done it. I've always done it in my teachings. I always prepare people for their demons manifesting. And see, the funny thing about it is when you're a student, you often can look at a classroom clown and say, oh, the teacher is talking about this classroom clown over here. I'll never be like this classroom clown not recognizing that the teacher is talking to you. Because oftentimes you are not in knowledge about what you're capable of. So oftentimes we look, we look over at the neighbor. We say, this is the neighbor that's being talked about. This is the fellow student. This is the student to the left. This is the student to the right. It's the student that's causing these problems. I'm talking about you. See, you're looking at their obvious di displays, but you be having hidden displays inside of you. That's the powerful thing. We're quick to call people witches and you're a witch, you're a witch yourself. That's the problem. We, we quick to call someone else a warlock and you're a warlock. Your warlock Abilities and traits have not been manifested in the spotlight. But it be you. It be you. Since one of the shocking things is Paul, who was Saul, when he was persecuting the church, they was the devil. But when Jesus knocks him down, Jesus reveals to them, you the devil. You the one persecuting me. But according to the knowledge that Saul had, which became Paul, Apostle Paul. He looked at everybody as if they was the devil. He thought that the church was the devil. 
He thought that everybody that was moving with the church was devils, that they was evil people messing up the good that was in the land. He looked at them as that. But then when Jesus shows him, it's you. All these things that you're looking at them as if they are, this is who you are. So saints in life, that's the same way. Oftentimes, you're quick to look at other people and say what they are. This person is that. This person is that. This person is that. And the truth is, that's you. You look at other person and say, how could they do that? And then you flip right around, do the same thing. This, this, how, this is the heart. And see, I want you to see this. You have to be careful that you, you don't operate in pride rather than power. Because see, power will sustain you. It'll keep you from doing it. But pride is you just saying, I won't do that. But you don't have no power to sustain what you're saying. That's the difference between pride and power. Oftentimes your observation is in pride, but there's no power to keep you. No wonder the Bible says that if somebody sins in Galatians, I believe, it says restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, which you be tempted also. It's powerful that it says deal with somebody when they fall into sin with the spirit of gentleness and restore such a one with the spirit of gentleness, lest you also be tempted. And it's funny that you can be so hard on what you see other people do. Ah, that, 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 that. And then you yourself got that same trait in you. Why do we invite people into our life? Because they tell us that they're not going to do what wrong people did. You're not hearing me. You will get a friendship with somebody because they have shown or said to you, I'm not going to do what this other friend did. So you open up yourself to them because they have giving you signs that they're not carrying the same spirit. The same appetite, the same viciousness, the same train of thought. But you could then realize that even the person doesn't know What's in them? I'm talking in some of y'all business right now. I'm just prophesying to you through this teaching. And me, myself, in ministry, I've seen many people. They come to my ministry. Prophet, I don't know how anybody could ever not listen to you. I don't know how anybody could ever criticize you. And then they become the critic. This is real life. Because this mind, it has to be tended to every day. You have to tend to your mind. You have to give your mind showers, mental showers. It's funny that you think about your physical body going into water every day and getting a shower and soaping off your body and scrubbing your body, but you don't think about your heart. How is it that you could wash your physical flesh that's not going to last forever, but you don't wash your own spirit, your own mind, your own thought life? How is that? How is it that you could wash 
a physical body, a physical man, but not wash the inner man. How is it that you could keep on protecting the hygiene of your natural, but not protecting the hygiene of your supernatural? Your inward heart, if you don't wash it, it will be filthy. Wow. Wow. Let's go to Psalm 119, verse 9. Look what it says right here. How could a young man cleanse his way but by, uh, but by taking heed according to the word of God? Now, I want to magnify this. It didn't say that the word of God is what cleanses him. It says that his way is cleansed because he's taken heed to the word of God. So saints, watch this here. He's not being cleansed because of the word. He's being cleansed because he's taken heed to the word. So the word could be present and he still could be filthy. And this is the mistake. That you can hear the word so much that you think the word is present, so I'm good. No, no, no. You got to take heed. You got to engage the word. You have to do that word. Lust and pride are the two things that take out anybody from the presence of God. Lust and pride. Because even in the presence of God, God will go against your appetite. God will go against what you want. God will go against what you said. God will go against your preference. In the presence of God, God will kill all those things. And so if you are a lustful person and a proud person, you'll go and pursue it even though God is ignoring it, cutting it off. Two things that destroys the path of the just is lust and pride. And see, something about pride is that you'll shut off the fact that you're lustful. You won't agree. No, I'm not lustful. Pride will reject. Saints, God looked at Lot's wife and was ticked off that she could even think about lusting after where he said was illegal. Why did God destroy Lot's wife? Because she's operating in lust and pride. She's lustful for what God said is not so. And she's proud because she doesn't even think she's wrong. She doesn't even think that it, it is wrong for her to covet Sodom and Gomorrah. See, Sodom and Gomorrah, it was a land that was full of perversion. You imagine God saying, come out from there. And she's actually looking back as if God is doing her wrong to bring her out of a land that hates God. Because she's in agreement with them. All the people in Sodom and Gomorrah was, was lustful. Look at the lust. They was knocking on the door saying we want you lust and then look at she turning back at the place of lust because she got the same spirit why you can't focus on God because you're lustful why you fall away from the will of God because you're lustful why you don't get your divine assignment done? Because you're lustful. How could you contemplate another path than what Jesus said he wants for your life? Because you're lustful. It's lust the reason why people fall away from God. I know men that I was mentoring as sons. And the only reason they fell away from 
God was because of lust. They wanted to sleep with somebody in the ministry. I know women that I mentored. The only reason they fell away, because a man came in their life. Lust. They started having sex. They know I don't stand for that. So then they start turning away from the ministry. No, I ain't following him. Because no, I don't want to feel no conviction. I don't want to hear nothing. All throughout my life, I watched people die by lust. Lust. And saints, what's two areas in um, John, 1 John, talked about lust, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh. You know what the lust of flesh is all about? You feel sexual. That's what it's all about. Lust of the flesh means this is your feeling realm where you feel. Or oh, I feel like having sex. I feel like doing this. Everybody I've seen fall away was because of lust. I've mentored young men. Tell them, no, you don't want to mess with that female. Leave that alone. No, I'm a, I, I, you try to stop me. I'm going to go mess with him. Fall away from God. Great destiny. Great potential. And choose to fall away. I've seen it with my own eyes time after time. I'm not talking about one. I'm not talking about two. I'm talking about many. I watch with my own eyes. People, they won't let go of their lusts. That's why they fail God. When really it's not about what you're trying to get done in your body or what you see with your eye. God has already created a path where the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye won't have power over you. But because you're hard-headed and you reject the path of God, you pitch yourself in a boat to be lustful. You pitch yourself in the boat to be vulnerable. You pitch yourself in the boat to have information of things that is illegal for your soulless system. When you come to God, you don't even know how lustful you are. I remember I used to rebuke people in my ministry. Stop looking at who's in this ministry. Stop talking about who's going to be your wife, who your husband. Stop all that stuff. I remember one time in my ministry, I started connecting people with each other. But God wanted me to see something. Because it got real weird. And the people that I did that stuff with was goofy. Real goofy. It was multiple people. And God told me to do it because God said, I want you to see their behaviors. I want to see how strange and weird they are. You got to set these people free. People are saying wrong. They don't know that they goofy. They don't see what we see. So God told me, shut it. Stop. Stop. That was years ago, like 2015, 16. God said, stop, shut it off. I've met people, they look real closed in. They look real sanctified. Find out that they're lustful. You find out that they're lustful, that they don't know how to keep their consistency with God because they're lustful. You wonder why people can't submit themselves to authority because they're lustful. And see, lustful people need attention. Lustful people, they need to be recognized. Lustful people, they need some type of recognition. They have to go somewhere where they're recognized. Since I've had people in my life, they'll, they'll say, well, well, you know, I, I, I stray away from you because you don't pay me no attention. I ain't got to pay you no attention. That's not my job. My job is to preach this gospel. I'm not working for you. I'm working for God. You just a part of the equation. I've heard people say, you know, the reason why I go other places, because you're not paying me no mind. Go where they paying you mind. Because in hell, everybody get all the attention they want. 
from them demons tormenting them for all eternity. You get all the attention you want. You live for attention on earth. You get the attention when you're in hell. Saints, if you someone that love attention, I blessed be God. I promise you, for all eternity, you choose hellfire, you'll get all the attention you want from them demons. Them demons will cater to you. They will, they will worship your craving for this, uh, uh, attention, and they'll torment you for all eternity. There's a place for people that love attention. I was cut from a different cloth. I came out of a pathway where nobody, I wasn't trying to get nobody's attention. That's why God gave me attention today. That's why God calls people to give me attention today. Because that wasn't the motive. That wasn't the goal. The goal was to sanctify yourself, to purify your heart. The goal was to walk in holiness and righteousness and purity. The goal was to complete your assignment and finish with flying colors. The goal was to do something for God that somebody else refused to do. The goal was to be a blessing to God and not a cursing. The goal was for God not to regret the fact that he gave you favor. The goal was to sanctify yourself and get away from the things that grieve the spirit. The goal was to accomplish the kingdom assignment and get promoted to the next agenda that was the goal your leader ain't got to pay no attention to you for you to feel, fulfill the assignment that you've been sent to fulfill with the leader they ain't got to do nothing for you you assigned to them you need them Holy Ghost give you a path for you to be free you don't want it you don't get free Somebody else get free. God got enough anointing, enough power, enough glory to give to you to set you free. You don't want it, there's somebody that want it, they'll get free. See, I'm teaching real heavy on here. I'm teaching real heavy on here. Why? Because this is the word of the Lord. This is what the Spirit of the Lord want to utter to the nations. This is what the Spirit of the Lord want to speak up to the nations. This is what the Spirit of the Lord want to get in your soul. Saints, ain't nothing happened to me. My day is beautiful today. Ain't nothing bad happened to me yesterday, today. My day is beautiful. This the word of the Lord to you. See, God want to speak this to your soul. Holy Spirit, desire a pure people. Holy Spirit desired people that will stop letting the flesh, the lust of the eye, the lust of uh, the flesh, the pride of life, keep on taking you out the will of God. Wake up. And it's because God's elect people are not dead to their self and you don't want to die to yourself. You run from what God says. You run from what he wants from you. You say that you want to serve him. You say that you love him. You say that you want to give him your all, but you a liar. You's a liar. You's a big liar. Because when he tell you how to give you, give him your all, he tell, tell you what is required for you to surrender. You run from it. You pick your own path. There's not no many ways to heaven. They lied. Tell us, you know, some people could be of other religions, but they may, I don't know if they're going to make it to heaven. They ain't going to make it to no heaven. Heaven is not made by many gods. It's made by one God, the great God, Jehovah. And Jesus is the only way because God came down in a body. The great God, Jehovah, came down in a man and named himself Jesus and called this man in the flesh his son. And only by this man can one be saved. Heaven was not created by multiple gods. It wasn't created by multiple religions. There's a straight and narrow path. The Bible says only a few there be that finds it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many people are picking destruction. You know why? Because destruction don't cause you to die to yourself. Destruction don't make you fall into a place of sanctification. D destruction, it lets you go where you want, do what you want, say what you want, have what you want, experience what you want, and there's no restrictions. 
That's why people choosing the straight, they, they choosing the broad way that lead to destruction. Religious people even pick that path because they ain't got to die to themselves. It's all about them. They're still in control. The straight and narrow path, God starts speaking to you specifically. It's specified. In the straight and narrow path, you can hear what God is saying. You ain't got to guess. You ain't got to wonder. You ain't got to assume. You ain't got to uh, 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 hope. He'll tell you plainly. I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to do this. You sit right there, still do it. It be the people that be talking about they love God so much. That when God give you a commandment, you don't even do it. Use a liar. I realize in life, everybody always asking for prophecy. You know I'm a prophet. People always asking for prayer. People always talking about what they believe in God for. The reason why you're not getting it because you do God wrong. Look at what the book of James says that some people ask God. You have not because you ask not. And then the Bible talk about you don't have it because you desire to spend it on your lust. Look, lust. See, the person that's asking God for it got the spirit of lust. So you got the spirit of disloyalty because inside of lust is disloyalty. You can't be loyal when you're lustful. Because your lust will drive you away every time it's time for you to commit yourself. Your lust will drive you away in another direction. When that man came to Jesus, he had a lot of money saying, what could I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tell him, go sell what you have, give it to the poor. He can't do it because he's a lustful man. So he could go find another path other than the path that Jesus just clearly told him, this is what I want you to do for you to have eternal life. This man, he could go risk his eternal soul for some dumb behind lust. Just be in lust and pride because he never came back and followed Jesus again. He went on with his life because he was set on his lust. Now, mind you, this is the state that everybody be in. You be the one talking about Jesus, I love you. You be the one talking about, Lord, use me. You be the one in prayer talking about, Lord, let your will be done in my life. Whatever you want to do in this season, I want to be a part of it. You be the one up there calling on God, talking about what's your will for my life. Lord, I pray that you'll lead me and guide me and show me the way. And then when God show you the way, you walk away sorrowful. You talk about you struggling. But you don't struggle when you're serving the devil. You don't struggle when you're drinking a martini in the club. You don't struggle when you having late night fun with your friends. You're not struggling when you're gossiping. You're not struggling when you're creating strife. You don't struggle when it's time to destroy somebody that you don't like. You don't struggle when it's time for you to create a feud with people that you don't want to get together. How come you don't struggle when it's time to serve Satan, but you struggle when it's time to serve God? How is it that we struggle when it's time for us to die to ourselves, but we don't struggle when it's time to give ourselves what we want to do? We don't struggle then. If I love God, I shouldn't struggle with the things of God. Who is it that you have chosen to serve in this life? Who? Who? If it's Jesus, then sit your ugly behind down and learn what Jesus wants from you. If it's Jesus, if it's Satan, then keep on going your way. Keep on doing your thing. Keep on following your own schedule. If it's Jesus, you'll be still and know that I'm God. That don't mean you don't do nothing. That don't mean that you don't got no job. That don't mean that you don't work at a job. That's not what be still and know that I'm God mean. Be still and know that I'm God. That means in your mind, you take the time to find out what is in me, what's coming out of me that's not supposed to come out of me. 
Be still and know that I'm God doesn't mean that you stop working and stop making money. That's foolish. Because if you don't make no money, you ain't going to have no seed to sow. You ain't going to have a way to honor God. You ain't going to have no way to eat no food. You ain't going to have no clothes. You ain't going to have no, no way to live the life that God said. Be still and know that I'm God is to evaluate yourself. Recognize, am I walking in demons that the generation before me walked in? Am I doing the same thing that they did? God be letting us see the life of people before us. They didn't rich. They wasn't rich. They got health problems. They got mind problems. They ain't reached their full potential. Then we sit right there and do the same thing that they did in our generation. We follow that same path and you don't recognize that you're actually missing the opportunity that God give you to be different. I remember when I was a teenager, I wasn't going to be disrespectful. But I ain't let nobody tell me nothing that was going to make me lazy. You know, sometimes people tell you, just wait on God. God going to come through for you now. I'm going to go work. Yeah. I'm a man. I'm not sitting up here talking so I'm waiting on no God. I'm going to make something happen. I got body. I got energy in my body because God want to bless the work of my hands. I ain't sitting around here telling some God going to make something happen for me. I'm a man. And I was young, not just a man. I'm young. When you get older in years, your body get different, not able to do everything. I'm talking about I'm a young man. You listen to other people counsel, they tell you, wait on God. It sounds great, but it's the counsel of Satan. It's time for me to work, to express my manhood, my divinity. It's time for me to solve some problems. It's time for me to humble myself underneath leadership. It's time for me to submit to the authority of someone that can reward me. That's another thing. Oftentimes, you listen to the wrong counsel that sounds so great. People tell us, uh, just sit and wait on God. God going to come through for you. If you don't do nothing, you don't receive nothing. God wasn't doing miracles in the Bible when people did nothing. They had to give five loaves and two fish. He multiplied it. They had to give the alabaster box. She gave the alabaster box. Then he said, you will be honored in our generation. The woman at Zarephath had to give her last meal, and then she received abundance. Her well didn't run dry. They had to give six barrels of water and then he turned it into wine. You're not getting into no blessing by doing nothing. So watch yourself right now. If you ain't doing nothing, guess what? Say it with me. Nothing coming to me now. Saints, in the other broadcast, I was talking about my daughter, Constance, right? I was talking about my daughter, Constance, in the last broadcast, right? Well, guess what, saints? Constance wrote and said her testimony is that today her manager gave her the highest raise at the business. Remember, I just called her name in less than 24 hours, 48 hours. That's the power. Now she got promoted to a high raise. You see that? Got the highest raise above the level that they allow people to get raised. She got it. But what Constance doing? She working. She's sewing. 
She asked me to pray for her job a couple years ago that she'll get a job to sow more seed. I prayed for it. She got the bigger job. They paid her more money. And she kept her vow. She didn't rob me. She kept on sowing. And then when she got the job, now she getting promoted again at the job. She got another promotion there. God ain't blessing you for doing nothing. I ain't got to beg Constance to serve me. Constance got a job. She got all type of things she got to do. And she's still always faithfully working with me. I talk like this because I, I want some of y'all to recognize you are the way you are because of a decision. How come she could flow? Why are you not flowing? She getting results. I ain't got to tell Constance, you know, I'm your prophet, right? So make sure you stay by me. You listen to what I'm saying. I ain't got to tell her none of that stuff. It's just the texture of your heart. Who have you chosen to be in this life? Do you really want the best that God has for you? Or are you going to let the devil trick you? I'm just showing you how quick money cometh work as well. Because I just had mentioned that. That's why the Spirit of God targeted me in that broadcast, say, mention her name. Because the spirit of the Lord know that he about to unravel a, a, a pay raise. And what did Constance just do? So $1,100. $1,100. Do you want to be a virtuous woman? God will always pit virtuous woman that's doing what you're supposed to do. You want to be a king. God will always pit a king in front of you that's doing what you're supposed to do. God is always placing somebody in your face that's doing something with dominion and not being disturbed. Now, saints, like I said, I can't swear for Constance. I can't swear for nobody. Could Constance fall away? Yes, yeah, she can fall away. Because everybody got free will. Does that mean that the devil never going to take her out? No. If she stick to what I'm saying, she'll be protected. You say, prophet, if she don't stick to what you're saying, she's not going to be protected? Yes. The Bible said by a prophet was Israel brought out and by a prophet was Israel preserved. Everybody that listen to me, they get preserved from evil. People that don't listen to me, they don't get preserved from evil. It's refreshing to see people that just purely listen to me and do what I say. Because you meet so much hard headed people. You meet people that are stiff neck. They don't want to turn. They won't live for the devil. You're doing everything to give them power to be free. You check on people. You think that they dominate and you find out. Uh, uh, uh. You still struggling with the devil? Let's go to Psalm 119, verse 29. Remove me from the, remove me, remove from me the way of lying. And grant me your law graciously. Remove me from the way of lying. 
and grant me your law graciously. Remove me from the way of lying. You know what this means? Take me away from these characteristics where I keep on being false with you, God. I keep on saying that I want your will. Then you show me your will. I keep on fighting you. I keep on saying I love you, but then you can't command me. I keep on saying I'm a woman of God. I'm a man of God. But when of God is being presented to me, I reject it. Remove me from the way of lying. Remove me from these characteristics where I make vows unto you and I won't pay the vow. Lord, if you do this for me, I'm going to do this for you. And if God does it for you. You don't keep your bargain. Remove me from the place of acting like I'm so focused and I know good and well I'm distracted. I'm so pure, but I know good and well I'm filthy. I'm so dedicated and know good and well that I am wavering and straying. This is so powerful. This is the word of the Lord. Remove from me the way of lying. Get me out of that place where I keep on lying to myself, lying to you, deceiving myself. Now, how do you lie? Let's go to James chapter one. This is some good prophetic preaching. This is what happens when you're underneath a prophet. You get the raw word of the Lord. Ain't nobody trying to play with your devils and play with no demons. You need to be free. This is my job. This is my assignment. My assignment sets you free from evil spirits. And evil spirits want to live inside of you, take you to hell. After all, Jesus done died on the cross, shed his blood, set you free, get rose again, gave you the Holy Ghost. And some of y'all on your way to hell still. There's an urgency. This is a 911 emergency. We going into the ninth month. It's August the 9th. After this, we going into month nine. Today is nine. Remember I told you that the, 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 the number nine represents emergency a lot. And today is the ninth of, of, of August, I believe. Here again, I also want to say this. Some of y'all be want to boast in y'all, but some of y'all got mental problems. So how can I boast in somebody that's already shaky with the devil? I be wanting to boast in y'all. And I'm not saying that the people I boast in don't be having no mental problems, but they overcame. Not saying that they're going to mess up, but I'm saying how, how am I boasting you and you showing me that the devil still mess with your mind? Then I bring you into a manifestation, magnification, and then you got a spirit that's double-minded. Then mess up the whole impartation. Some of y'all be messing up your credibility with God because you show that something wrong with your head. Then God look at you like, what? How am I going to promote you now? How am I going to pitch you on a pedestal? There's something wrong with you. You still got percentage of the devil talking to you. Well, I can't, I can't do that. God didn't want that woman, didn't want that man inside the garden when they had the percentage of the devil talking to them. He didn't want them in the garden. He drove them out because he already knew you opened up yourself to this whip. You gave your time over to this fallen being. It mess up. It mess up God's Intent. I want to encourage you. Be trustworthy to God and show him your sincerity and your purity. Show him that you're truthful and honest. Show him that you mean business, that you really love him. So he could bring you into being an example. 
and trust your example. God put Lucifer on a pedestal. Lucifer go turn everybody. 33% of the angels against God. That's mismanagement of the pedestal. That's mismanagement of the portrayal. Some of y'all, God want to use you as a portrait, but he can't use you because you're going to turn people away with your shakiness, with your rebellion, with your stubbornness. When somebody look at you, they're going to take on that same spirit of inconsistency, disloyalty, disobedience, fear. Look at James chapter 1. Look what it says right here. In verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. So it is the word of God that saves your soul. Look what it says. Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. What is talking about lust? It's talking about craving what God says is not a part of your path. Craving what God says is not supposed to be done, pursued. Look. Look what it says. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Saints, I want to say something. I want to rebuke some of my people. Don't. As a matter of fact, I ain't going to rebuke you publicly. I know what to do. I ain't going to rebuke you publicly. God, I know, I know how the devices of Satan work. I ain't going to rebuke you publicly. I, I, I'm going to talk to some of y'all in private on what not to do. As a matter of fact, you'll hear from me before tonight is over. I'll talk to you and tell you what not to do. I ain't going to tell you publicly because I know how the devil works. Now... Let's go here to James chapter 1, verse 21. It says to lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. It's saying lay aside all these things that make you lustful and distracted, that make you go astray. Lay them aside. Let them go. And it says, receive with meekness. So that means that you can receive the word without meekness. It's telling you to receive the word with meekness. That means to let the word come in to you with you having a teachable spirit, a receptive spirit, a spirit that wants the accuracy that it needs with God. Having the attitude of knowing I don't want to deceive myself. I want what God says is my path. If you're not sending me to church, I'm not going to no daggone church building. If you ain't send me there, why am I there? If you ain't send me back to no Bible school, why am I at Bible school? If you didn't send me to get a degree, why am I going to go get a degree? If you didn't send me to another state, why am I traveling in another state? If you didn't send me on no vacation, why am I on a vacation? You didn't send me to the park, why am I at the park? You ain't send me to the mall while I'm at the mall. You see what I'm saying? Laying aside all those things that create disloyalty to the will of God, a desire to go contrary, to be evil, to be wicked, to twist God's word and to use it so that I could fulfill my wrong decisions. Look what it says. 
Wherefore, lay upon all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word. So the word is engrafted. It's tattooed. It has the ability to stick to your soul and bring cleansing and changing if you entertain it, which is able to save your soul. So the word has an ability to deliver your soul out of what is evil, out of what is not God's will. The word of God has power to get your soul out of what is what, what God is not saying, what God has not scheduled. It has an ability, a grace to set you free. This is the grace of the word. Look what it says. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a mirror, in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. That means that when you hear the word and don't do it, it's the same way you looking at yourself in the mirror, seeing your hair is, hair is not done, and then you go outside and act like you all cute. Like you, you, you look all night. You, you, you ain't even do your hair. Like you, you ain't brush your teeth. You didn't clean your face. You ain't do none of those stuff. And you go outside and act like you didn't recognize that that stuff was messed up. Are you seeing this? Imagine you got paint all over your face. You just finished painting and you look in the mirror, see that you got paint. And then you go outside and go to a convention, a meeting and act like you ain't got paint all over your face. And you acting like there's no paint on your face. That's how God likens someone that hears the word and does not do it. You're acting like you don't see what's undone in your life. You acting like you don't see what's messed up and you refuse to fix it. Watch this here in verse 25. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty. See, the word of God is a law of liberty and continueth therein. And be if not a forgetful hearer, but a do of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. It's telling you how to be blessed. You got to let the word cleanse you from all them demonic, religiously demonic stuff that you got going on. That you disguise in the name of God and it's demonic. It ain't God. You stamping the Lord Jesus on it. The Lord Jesus not in it because the Lord Jesus is in what he says. He's not in what you say, what you want to fulfill. He's in what he says. You can't pick the Lord Jesus in what you want. He is God. He picked what he want. You do what he said or it's not going to be blessed. He's not going to bless nothing that he didn't say. Watch this here. Look at verse 22. But be ye doers of the word. And not hearers only, deceiving your own self. 